Um, welcome to our Bible study today. Um, it's a pleasure seeing you here. Let me also join up uh, and put it live on Facebook also. Give me a, give me a minute. Let me put it here. Today we're speaking about um, a specific topic here, which is a uh, can a Christian sin. Uh, give me a second. Let me put this here. Otherwise, my day has been okay. Everything has been fine. Mm, I really thank God for this, and I. Uh, I thank him for giving us a new day that we can be able to see uh, put the public and in a Christian sin is the topic of today. Uh, hmm. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, hope you're doing okay. Hope everything is uh, rolling on well. Um, today I want to speak about this topic of uh, can I Christian sin. Let me just uh, change the topic here. I don't know if I can change it right away. As the people are joining, also, um, hope you had a good week, a good weekend. Was it a week? A good weekend. <laughs> Let me uh, just edit this and put on the title. Well, can uh, Christian. Can a Christian sin? I don't know if you've ever asked yourself this question. Can a Christian sin? Is it possible to uh, be a Christian and find yourself uh, doing some sinful stuff? Is it really possible? Uh, no, let me put this camera up a bit. So now, uh, today I want to speak about can really a Christian sin because we know we are we are already uh, born again. Is is there a way that you can find someone has done something and for sure you have sinned against God and now God is not impressed with you or there's something which is not uh, okay concerning salvation. So now, first and foremost, we have to uh, read something here. Let me let me share my screen and show you a certain. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me show you something here. Um, there's a certain verse in Romans, Romans 4, uh, from verse 4. It tells us something here. The Bible is very clear. It tells us, now to him that worketh is the reward reckoned not of grace, but of debt. So if you're working for your salvation, then your salvation is of debt, is not of grace, okay? But to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So if you want your uh, faith to be counted for righteousness, then there's nothing that you're supposed to do for your salvation. All that you need uh, to do is just basically believe because the Bible tells us whosoever believes. The Bible is always talking about believe, 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 believe. But people have changed the gospel of believing to another gospel that you cannot really explain what kind of gospel is this. People are being told to do this, do that. The more you give to the poor, the more you'll, you know you'll be saved in some way. You see, like Islam, they say the more you give and the more you do good deeds, the more you're like buying your 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 place to in heaven. I don't know what they call their heaven. Uh, also, the Catholics, they're always talking about you have to do this and this and this, go for the different masses. I don't know. Sorry. I mean, mass, um, all those kind of stuff. And they're told that you have to 
uh, be baptized for salvation. You have to, you see, to remove the original sin. We see also um, the SDA, they tell people that for you to be able to be saved, you need to do some good works there. You need to keep the law, keep the law, do the 613 laws that uh, are written in the Bible. Let me ask okay. you. Are you sure you're even keeping the 613 laws? It's really even not possible. How, how do you keep 613 laws? It's absolutely not possible. So um, what we need to understand is uh, that the Bible is very clear on what we need to do for us to be saved. And uh, that is purely and basically, uh, let me mute this friend of mine here. Uh, yes. So the Bible is very clear about what we need to do for us to be saved is just basically to believe. So believing is the main thing. Uh, let's see also Galatians, Galatians 2.16. The Bible tells us something else here. Galatians 2.16. Uh, I want to show this. Galatians. Uh, Galatians uh, 2 and verse 16. It should be 16 years. Galatians 2, 16, it tells us something here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. <laughs> now, this one is for the SDA and all the other people who think that they can be justified by keeping the law. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. This is what justifies you. Justification is basically getting saved. You're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, okay? So you're justified by believing in Christ, not by keeping the law, okay? Not by anything to do with the law. And not by the works of the law. For by the works, now look at this. For all those who think that you can keep 613 laws and be justified or be saved, then you're lying to yourself. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No flesh will be justified by keeping the law. Okay. Now, I want to, I want to say something here. You see, there are so many people who will wonder and ask themselves, then how, how are we supposed to live holy? If we are not doing anything, uh, you know, it's not about us doing good things for us to be saved. Let me tell you, uh, there, uh, James, he told us, in the book of James, he told us that faith without works is dead. And down there, he says that, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works, okay? Why is he saying that I will show you my faith by my works? Because the moment you get saved, not through anything, not through uh, doing good deeds of the law, not uh, by doing uh, baptism, not by giving the, to the poor, not by speaking in tongues, not by doing anything. When you get saved by just believing the gospel only, the next thing which happens is you get a new heart and a new mind. God gives you a new heart and a new mind. So if you have a new heart and a new mind, how are you going to do the old things? If I change you right now, uh, when I got saved, I used to be, before I got saved, I used to be just a, uh, I, I loved posting, you know, some nonsense on Facebook, uh, just memes and all those kind of things. Like, just like the way we always post all the time, posting jokes, posting politics, posting this and that. But uh, that is what really made me happy. I was always posting me clubbing, going to different places and how we had the booze the whole night. And you see, but when I got saved, something happened. There was a transformation. Immediately, I had a change of heart and a change of mind. And the Holy Spirit came inside me because the Bible tells us in Ephesians, 4, Ephesians 1.13, in whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and he starts directing your path. He starts changing you from the way you used to behave back then and gives you a new mind and a new heart. And now the old is gone and the new has come. You start feeling I don't want to do these wrong things that I used to do before. I want to do good things. I don't want to walk in the ways that I used to walk before. Now I want to walk in the day, ways of salvation. I don't want to have the same thoughts that I used to have before. 
but now I want to have different thoughts. You see, there are people who say, I have already gotten saved, but 24 seven, I'm always having bad thoughts in my mind. I'm thinking about, you know, uh, doing bad things that I used to do before, maybe uh, stealing, maybe uh, killing or fornicating or doing whatever things that I used to think before. Yes, those thoughts will come. It doesn't mean that because you're saved, <laughs> those things will not come in your mind, they will come. But like it is always said, you can never prevent birds from flying above your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest on your head. You can prevent these bad thoughts from building a nest on your head because you're a new person, you have changed and you believe the gospel. Before I continue, let me first say what exactly the gospel is because many people don't really understand what salvation is and what being born again is. Now, the Bible tells us that in whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth. So first you must hear something before you trust. What do you hear? The Bible continues and says, it is the gospel of your salvation. Ephesians 1.13, for those who are thinking, where exactly am I quoting? Ephesians 1.13, in whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit, Spirit of promise. Now, first you have to hear the word of truth. And after you hear that word of truth, then you understand it and then you believe it. So what is this gospel of our salvation? What is this gospel that you're being told? Believe, believe, believe this gospel. Now, I want to show you exactly what the gospel is. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians. Corinthians 15 uh, from verse 1 through 4. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. You see, this is the gospel. The Apostle Paul is telling us this is the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So you are standing in that gospel, by which also you are saved. So this is the gospel which saves you. Okay, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, why is the Apostle Paul saying that we keep in memory what he preached unto us? Because unless you keep the gospel in your memory, you can never be saved. And uh, something that you're keeping in your mind, it means you have understood it. If there's a formula that you've been taught in class and you have not kept it in memory, then you have not understood it. You have only had it and crammed it. And that means... If an exam comes and uh, the question is twisted in a different way, you will fail that question. Why? Because you only crammed a formula, but you never really understood. You never kept it in memory. So for us to be saved, you have to really understand what the gospel is. The gospel is basically the good news of what Jesus did for us. Okay. Verse uh, three says, for I deliver unto you first that which I also received. Now, there's a big word here, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. How did Jesus die? Jesus died by shedding his blood at the cross. He shed his blood, and through the shedding of that blood, that's how we became saved. All right? We, was, we were saved by us believing the gospel, okay? So unless you believe this gospel, you believe that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for you. He did all this for you. Then you can never be saved. Okay, that's salvation. So do you see there's nothing that you need to do? You don't need to give tithe. You don't need to give offering. You don't need to visit the sick, the poor, and all this. These are good things. You can do them. Go visit the poor, the sick, help the needy, do all these good things. But that one does not give you salvation. Those are extra things that you're only doing for uh, the kingdom of God and for helping people. And, you know, the way God says he loves a cheerful giver, but that one doesn't give you salvation. Salvation is free. It's absolutely free, 100% free. All right. It, that's why it's called the gift of salvation. Okay. The gift of salvation. Huh? Let me show you something here. Let me show you something here. The Bible tells us that we are saved by grace. Okay. Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 2, 
8 to 9, it says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, for by grace. So grace is what? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. There are so many things that you don't deserve, but you've, you've gotten it just by grace. You know, you are supposed to die. You're supposed to go to hell, but Jesus changed that. And he said, no, you'll not go to hell because I want to give you grace, what you don't deserve. I want to give it to you. Okay. For by grace, are you saved through faith? So for grace to activate, you must have faith, okay? You must have faith for you to receive the works of the grace. I mean, the, the grace of God. So for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Are you seeing? Salvation is a gift. So when you see somebody is trying to sell you salvation, then you tell them, no, 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 I think you're lying to me. Salvation is purely a gift, not of works. Salvation is not of works, okay? There is no work that you need to do to be saved, lest any man should boast. So now let me tell you, let me ask you something. Then why do we see in the book of James another verse which is telling us that we have to do something? People go to that and they say, oh, no, 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 Keith, you see, there's something wrong. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. I've spoken about that and I want to repeat it so well. The reason you must have uh, uh, works after you get faith is because there is no way you can show a true faith if you have no good works. There's no way you can show that you have changed your mind and you have changed your heart unless you have good works. Why? Because the Bible tells us here in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. We are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So after we have been created, we have been made new creatures. We have been created unto good works, to do good things, to walk in the ways of God, not to walk in the old ways that we used to walk, so that we can be a testimony to others and that others may say, wow, if there is a God, I want that God of this person. All right, let's continue. Titus 3, 4. Titus, Titus 3, uh, 4. Titus 3, 4 tells us something here as well. Mm, am I in Titus? Yes. Oh, good. Great. It tells us, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works, he appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So we are not saved because of anything else. We are not saved by works that we have done, not because I have stopped sinning. Today we say, oh, Keith has stopped sinning. Keith no longer drinks. Keith no longer parties. He no longer does a, a lie to people. He's no longer corrupt. He's no longer this and that. So now he has been saved because of that. No, it is not by my works of righteousness that have been saved, by, but by his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration is changing and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You remember when, uh, when we, 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 we um, what do I say? When Adam sinned, the Holy, the spirit died. So now there was no spirit in man. He was just a dead man walking. He was a walking zombie. But now, when um, you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and he regenerates the, the spirit, okay? So you have a new spirit. So you become a full person. Before you're dead, you're a walking dead person. But the moment you get saved and you're not saved by your works, you're saved by the mercy of Jesus Christ, then that's how you're able to gain the Holy Spirit, all right? And remember, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1, 7, I don't want to go to that because I don't want to take much time, that we are saved through, the, we, are, we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ, all right? And also in Romans 3, 25, it tells us in whom we, uh, we have, uh, right? It tells us that Jesus is our propitiation. Let me, let me just go there. I think this one is also very important to show you. Romans, uh, Romans 3, 25, it tells us something here, that whom God has set forth, who is being set forth? Jesus, 
is being set by God the Father, whom God has set forth to be a, a propitiation, a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So what does the word propitiation mean? Let's see if we have that word. Propitiation. Mm -hmm. Propitiation, let's see what that word means. Uh, it's always good to check these meanings because if you don't check, all right. So it means relating to an appeasing or expiating, having ah, placenting and expiating. Hey, Jesus Christ. This, yes, that is what uh, basically let's just say appeasing, appeasing. So Jesus appeased the wrath of God. Or you can use all these other terms here. I don't know how to mention them. Basically, it means he appeased the wrath of God through his blood. He appeased God. God was really angry at mankind, but he appeased him through. Through what? Through the blood. Let's go back again. It's like it was a substitute. Whom God has set forth. Whom God has set forth. Uh, where is the Romans 3. 25. Let's go back again there. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. Through the forbearance of God. So God has already substituted his anger. He has forgiven us. He has appeased his anger through the blood of of his son, Jesus Christ. But now the only way we can receive that propitiation is through faith in that blood, okay? So that's really, 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 really important for us to know, okay? Uh -huh. Now let's check also Romans 5, 9. Romans, Romans 5, uh, 9. Romans 5, 9 says something here. Much more than being now justified by his blood. You see, again, we are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not justified by the things that we do. We are not justified by anything. We are not justified by our actions. We are not justified by keeping the law. We are not justified by being baptized. We are not justified by doing good to others. We are not being justified by just believing that, you know, uh, believing that Jesus is the son of God. You see, believing Jesus is the son of God is half a truth. It is a truth, yes, but it is half a truth. You believing that Jesus saves or Jesus is the son of God does not justify you. You need to believe that it is the blood of Jesus that he shed, which was used for me to be able to be forgiven of my sins. But if you just say, I believe that Jesus is God. Come on, even the devils believe and they tremble. The Bible tells us that. But now the Bible tells us that we are justified by his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Then we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we are saved by believing that Jesus died. He shed his blood for us because the Bible tells us the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. By the blood that he shed and him going to be buried, he became our unleavened bread. He took our sins to the grave and he rose by the power of the Holy Spirit. Unless you believe the whole concept of Jesus dying, shedding his blood, being buried and rising again. When you believe that, that's the only time you can be saved. Anything else will not save you, okay? So now I want to show you something here. I want to explain to you something that uh, which colorates with exactly what our topic is. Can a Christian sin? Now, <laughs> Let me tell you something. When we talk about this aspect of can a Christian sin, first we have to understand after you have been saved, what really happens? What is the procedure? We have believed the gospel and then you have been saved. There's something which happens and I want to show you uh, in Colossians 2, 11. Let me go here to Colossians. Colossians 2, 11. Now, I want to show you what really happens when you get saved. The Bible says, in whom you have 
in whom you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body, you see, there's a body which has been put off. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, before we continue, I want to show you this. The moment you are saved, you are circumcised by the circumcision made without hands. What is circumcision? Circumcision is basically cutting off. You are cut off. And what is being cut off? The, sin, the body of the sins of the flesh is cut off through the circumcision of Christ. Let's see verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. So the baptism which Jesus was buried, you are also buried with him as well. So now you don't need water. You don't need these other things which are, you, you don't need to do something. There's nothing that you need to do. That's why right now, the baptism is by the Holy Spirit, is not by water. Remember what John the Baptist told people, that I baptize you, I, John the Baptist, I baptize you by water, but there is he that is coming. Who is greater than I? Who is, I mean, if his sandals are not worthy to untie? Who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit? and also with fire. And of course it continues, it says what kind of fire? Whose fun is in his hands and he will, he will separate the, you know, the tears from the, uh, from the wheat and then he will burn them. So for those who also say that, uh, oh, we are getting the uh, baptism of fire. Baptism of fire is in hell, my friend. Go and read that Bible verse very well. The baptism that you're supposed to get right now is of the Holy Spirit, but the, John the Baptist was saying that he will baptize. Jesus is coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So there are two kinds of people who will be getting baptism. The good people with the Holy Spirit and the bad people with fire because it's the one who is going to, you know, do all that. And uh, th that's a long story. I don't want to go there. So we are buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him through the faith wherein you're also risen, you have been buried, and then you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. So are you seeing something here that, uh, that you have been, you, you've died and been buried and you've rose again with Jesus by faith, okay? And also you have been cut off. You have been circumcised. It's like, one of the layer of you, one of your layer is being cut off. It's been cut off out. And then there's a new creature and there's an old creature. Your flesh is called the body of the sin of the flesh. You know, is the sinful body has been cut off. It's, it's at the side. And then we have a new creature, which is the spirit and the soul, which has already been purchased. Now, if you've been cut off, if you've been circumcised, is there a way that you can return back the flesh which was there? It's not possible. If you've been born, can you say, I can be unborn? No. Can you tell your mother, please, uh, mom, the way I look at things nowadays, I don't think if I was really born. I Was I really born? No. <laughs> My friend, if you're born, you're born. If you're married, you're married. The moment you signed that signature and you said I'm married, can you wake up and say, mm, is that wife really mine? Am I really married because we argued? No, we are the bride of Christ. We are married to Christ. <laughs> You're also dead with Christ and reason. Someone who has dead, he can never say, mm, am I really sure if I really died or not? No, once you have died, you have died. And once you have risen, you have risen. So that one already tells us concerning can a Christian sin? And the Bible is very clear concerning sin. And it tells us exactly something here. Let me, let me share my screen once again. Uh -huh. Let me show you this verse. <laughs> You'll be so much amazed by this. Mm. Look at this verse. The Bible tells us in uh, the book of 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. If you're born of God, you do not commit sin. Wow, this is amazing. 
Why? For his seed remains in him. Whose seed remains in him? The seed of God. You have the seed of God within you. You've been born. You've been, you have the seed of God within you. So God does not sin. Neither can you sin. But the flesh can sin. Let me just continue here. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. So now what is born of God cannot sin. But what is born of the flesh can sin. When you've been born again, you have two different kind of bodies within you. You have the body, which is cannot sin, which is the, the spirit and the soul, which is the new purchased possession, the new creature inside you, which cannot sin. And also you have the, uh, you have the, 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 the carnal body, the flesh, which can sin. Your flesh, the outer body can sin, but the inner you, the one which is born of God cannot sin. So you're walking with two different physics. <laughs> you're walking two different people walking together. <laughs> I know this one is really hard for people to understand, but I want to explain very well that you have two different bodies walking inside you. The, the flesh, which can sin, and the spiritual body, which cannot sin. And that's why the Bible tells us, walk with, in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Let us walk in the spirit. Let us do things in the way of the spirit, not in the way of the flesh. Because the flesh is fighting against the spirit. The flesh is fighting the spirit. Now, it's, it's, it's uh, really important to understand that the body gets dead. The body dies. Let me show you. Romans 6. And uh, verse six, when you get saved, your body purely is dead. Let me show you this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Your old man is your old body. It's already crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, sin will be found where? Sin will be found walking in the flesh. But now you have another new body, which is the new creature which has been created of God, which cannot sin, which is waging war between, you see, there's a lot of war between your flesh and your new creature. And you always, you know, one is contrary to the other all the time. This one wants this, but this one wants this. That's why all the time in, in yourself, you always feel, I I'm going to do something wrong, but I'm always feeling, oh my goodness, why, why am I doing this? There's always grieving in yourself. The Bible tells us that um, in Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is inside you and is grieving. Anytime that you do something wrong, the Holy Spirit grieves. He feels angry. He feels bad. He feels, oh no, why did I have to do this? and is inside you, is inside the new creature. So the old creature, the old man wants to sin, but the new man does not want to sin. Now let's continue this. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Come on. He that is dead is freed from sin. So you cannot sin. There is no way the new creature can sin. It cannot sin. There's no way you can backslide. For those who tell you that, oh, this person has backslidden, this person has, uh, you know, is now a sinner, this person has done this and that. The Bible tells us very well that they went out away from us because in the first place, they are not with us. For if they were with us, they could have stayed. That is the Bible, not me. I will show you that verse. Let me just continue first here. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So if we died with Christ, then we will live with him, knowing that being raised from the dead dieth no more. Come on, my friend, you died and you rose with Christ. So you will have to die no more. You have already died. It's only once. The Bible says uh, you die once and after that judgment. So you have already died with Christ and you have rose with Christ. So how many times are you going to die? How many times are you going to Say that, uh, you see, I don't know if I'm really sure I'm not. No, you, <laughs> you died once. Death has no more dominion over him. So there's no way that you're going to say, oh, I'm again in sin. I'm going to die again in sin. No, you died once with Christ and you rose with him. So that is finished. For in that, for in that he died, he died 
and to sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this Paul is trying to tell us, please, Stop the way you're feeling and the way you're thinking, oh, am I really dead? Am I really saved? Am I really this and that? No. Reckon your body is dead. According to God, your body, your flesh is dead. At the day of redemption, what is redemption? It's going to give you a new body. So this body that you're walking, you're just a walking dead. This body is already dead, according to God. But now, what happens is you have a new creature inside you which cannot sin. So don't live in this dead body's wishes. Live in the ways of the spirit and then you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So a Christian cannot sin. You absolutely cannot sin. Let sin not therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey in the last day of. Uh, let, let me show you again. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall have shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin will not have any dominion. It cannot have any place on you because you're not longer under the law. You are under the grace. Now you're believing under the grace. You're not kept by the law because the Bible tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is transgression of the law. But right now we are not under the law. The law was made for the unrighteous people. Now you're a righteous person. Now you're a new person. You're a new creature. So there is no way you can be able to sin. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now, should we walk in the ways of the flesh because now we know we cannot sin? No. What then? Okay. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you also obey, whether be of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? So if you decide you're going to follow the ways of the flesh, you will die. Let me tell you, you will die, but your flesh will die, but your soul, the new creature, will not die. This is a bit confusing, but I'll show you a good example here. And I'll show you from the Bible. Let me just give you a simple example. Now, if you say, I am saved, and I know I cannot die, and I know nothing can happen to me, and you take a gun and you go and rob a bank, do you want to tell me that uh, you will not be shot by the police? You will be shot. And you will be killed because the wages of sin is death. When you follow this, when you follow the, 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 the fleshly carnal uh, way of life living, you will die. The flesh will die. But of course, your spirit will be saved because you're already a, a saved person. I want to show you an example here. First Corinthians, First Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it tells us something. It gives us an example, good example of someone who was saved. And yet he did something wrong. He, he did something sinful, but he was still saved. And what happened? Let me show you here. This is Apostle Paul talking to the, uh, the church of Corinth. And it's saying to these people who are saved, it's telling them, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is uh, as is not much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, Paul is saying this fornication in this church of Corinth, come on, guys, is too much. It is too much, you guys, that someone is taking his father's wife. There's even incest in the church. And these people, they are saved. Now, listen to what he's saying. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So you members of the church, you're not even bothered that this person who is doing this, who is tarnishing the name of God, being saved, being saved, but he's still doing sinful things that he might be taken away from you. And then Paul continues, for I verily as, as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and by my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to the verdict here, to this sinful 
carnal Christian, what Paul is telling him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together and by spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, okay? For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, why is this person spirit being saved? Because when you're a new creature, when you're already born again, you can't lose your salvation. Yes, the wages of sin is death. When you live carnally, when you live as a 24-7 as a, as a, as a doing always wrong things, and you don't follow the ways of the spirit, you walk in the flesh, my friend, you're going to die. You, you'll be given up for Satan, for the destruction of the flesh. Your flesh will be destroyed. But of course, <laughs> the spirit will be saved. But now let me tell you something concerning this. One thing that people have never understood is that if it was that simple, then I can get saved and then I go and do my things. Then why don't we just get saved and then go and do our things? It is because salvation is all about change of mind. It's not a repetition that you do. It is not a Bible that you pick and just, okay, read here. The sinner's prayer, God forgive my sins, I've done. Oh, have I said it well? Have I repeated those words the way they're supposed to? It's not a recitation. Salvation is not a recitation. It's not a deed. It's not being laid of hands and then you're told, okay, brother, now you're saved. Salvation is not that. Salvation is a change of mind. You have to change your mind. What does, what, what do we mean? When we say repent, repent comes from a Greek word, which is called metanoia. Metanoia means a change of mind or turning from one direction to another direction. Repentance does not mean stop sinning. It means change your mind. The moment you change your mind and you say, I was believing in other gods, in, in idols. I was believing in things which are not uh, my God. I was believing in myself. I was believing in my money, I was believing in things, I was believing in this and that. And you say, from today, I've started believing in Jesus Christ. He's my savior, he saved me, and I've started believing in him. The moment you do that, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and he changes your mind and changes your heart. He gives you a new heart, gives you a new mind. And the old is gone, the new has come. You're no longer interested in the old things, you're interested in the new things. So with a changed mind, my friend, you'll not even be seeing any interest to go and do bad things. Yes, even if you do bad things, you cannot go to hell. No, but you will not even have one thought of doing those things because you have a changed mind and a changed heart. And that's exactly what salvation is. And that's why we see a lot of false conversions because people, instead of first hearing the gospel, how Jesus died for their sins, was buried and rose again, Instead of them first hearing and understanding what salvation is, and then after they understand, they keep that salvation in memory, and it also moves to their heart so that they can believe from their hearts. Most of the people, what do they do? They just go and repeat some sentences. You will see a pastor comes and he preaches about Moses, Abraham, and many other things, and he says, before we close, is there anyone who wants to receive Jesus into their hearts? Come on. That is a lie. Where is the gospel? How will they believe on whom they have not even had? The Bible tells us very well here. Let me, let me show you here. Um, how will they believe uh, whom they have uh, not had? Let me show you that verse. It's in Romans. Romans 10, something. Let me show you there. Mm. Okay, let me, let, me, let me check the verse. I want to show this verse. Eh? Let me just check from my Bible and I type it here so that you can understand. I think it's Romans 10. Ah, yeah, Romans 10. Let me just type it. Eh? Romans 10, verse, mm, verse 10. Romans 10, 10. Let me show you this. A very simple way, which is explaining. For with the heart, man believeth. You see, it is from the heart that you believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth, you confession is made unto salvation. So you 
believe from the heart and you confess out what you have believed. If you love someone, do you go to that person and, and tell them, come on, eh, so and so, I love you. And then now you start loving them. No, you first love them from your heart and then go and tell them what you feel from your heart. Because you believe from your heart and then you confess what you feel. You believe from your heart having understood because unless you understand the gospel, it can never move to your heart. And that's why the Pharisees, they knew the whole law. But they, Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because these people, they only knew it. They crammed the law, but they never understood it so that it could come to their hearts. Okay? For with the heart a man believes unto salvation, and with the mouth confession is made. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek and all that. Okay? Now look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will you call on someone you have not even believed? How will you speak and say, oh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, come into my heart? And you have not even believed in him. You're just reading a sentence. How? How will you be able to believe on someone? Uh, uh, how will you call on him and you have not even believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? The Bible tells us, how will you believe on him whom you have not even heard? So when you see someone just preach and preach and preach and then says how many wants to be saved come here and receive the, uh, the, the uh, come and receive Jesus into your hearts come on where is the gospel my friend where is the gospel have you told people the gospel have you told them that this is how you are to be saved this is what Jesus did for you for you to be saved have you told them that? Do they really understand so that they can believe? Because salvation is a change of mind. And you change your mind after you have understood something. And how shall they hear without a preacher? There must be someone who has understood and who will tell you, hey, this is the gospel. Go and read it. Understand it. This is what Jesus did for you. And that's why Jesus put forth the apostles to preach. And he set forth the church through the apostles so that the church, they can preach and tell people, this is how you are saved. But nowadays, the church is not telling people how people are supposed to be saved. All that they are telling people is, receive Jesus into your heart. Give this, give this, give that. That is false salvation. And that's why you hear people saying they are losing, so-and-so has lost salvation. There's nothing like losing salvation. There's nothing like losing salvation. Let me show you. I, I love giving facts in what I'm saying. Uh, let me show you. Uh, this verse I'll show you. Uh, yes, this one. First John 2.19. Let me show you this one. First John 2.19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. When you hear somebody has backslidden... <laughs> Come on, he was not even with us. For if they had been with us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they may be made manifest that they were not all of us. They were not with us. So when you hear somebody has backslidden, most probably <clears throat> this is what happened. He went to a prosperity church and he was just told about, hey, their goodies, 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 and things coming up. Come on, you just believe you just uh, say, repeat this prayer and you'll be saved. And they were never rooted in this true doctrine. They were never rooted in, in the scriptures. So they never really understood salvation. Let me, let me tell you, Jesus told us, gave us a parable, the parable of the sower. And this is a true definition of salvation. True definition of salvation. Let me explain to you. The sower, he had some seeds and he threw some seeds. Uh, the first seeds he threw, I don't know is the first or what, but he threw some seeds on a rock. And uh, those seeds, because there was a rock, they could not make roots and they could not grow. So they withered out. So this is the kind of Christian who is basically given a false doctrine, a false conversion. Come here, just say these words and that's it. So there is no root in the doctrine. So he doesn't really understand what is going on. So when he wants to grow, 
he will try and grow, but he's on a rock. He doesn't really understand. He doesn't know. Everything is hard. He tries to read the Bible. There's no Holy Spirit in him. Because when you get saved is when you get the Holy Spirit and he opens the Bible for you and he reveals things for you. So he tries to read the Bible and he's a rock. He cannot understand anything. He's just seeing words, words and ink, paper and ink. That's the first kind of Christian false conversion. The second one is the one who goes on a, uh, the, the second seeds were thrown uh, where there, are, there were some thorns, okay? These are the prosperity gospels, okay? They are told, come here. You see, Jesus is all about wealth and health. You will gain this, you will gain this. You, will, you know, come here. We are the rich the riches of Abraham. All those kind of answers that people try to be told. You see, come here. You see, you'll be you'll be elevated. You'll be like who? You'll be like God. You'll be like all those kind of things that they are told in the prosperity church. But what happens? The moment they want to grow and life starts choking them, they are like, I, I was promised salvation whereby there'll be a lot of prosperity. I was promised good things. Why am I being choked by the things of the life? Why am I being choked by, you see, by tribulation, when you see uh, some people, they see maybe you've lost a child or maybe something has happened or maybe you've lost your job or something. And you say, no, there's no God. Oh, why are things happening like this to me? Because you are choked. You are choked by things and you are promised good stuff by the prosperity churches. So your doctrine, you are not rooted in the right soil and the right environment. And the third one, there are seeds which were thrown along the way, along the path. And these are people who just get saved for the sake of, you know, hey, let me just get saved. Oh, I heard the rapture is coming. Let me just get saved. Hey, in case, so that I am, I, let me just get saved because I saw a crusade. Let me just save, get saved because I saw a church and it was on a Sunday and people are raising their hands. I went there. So they were not rooted in anything. They were just planted along the road. And what happens? When their friends will come and they tell them, ah, you bro, come on, you can get saved. Let's go and have this. Let's go and do uh, some uh, uh, wild parties. Let's go and do this and that. Let's go and steal. Let's go do some deals. Let's go and uh, cheat and do all this. It's like, mm, these people, they are stolen. Just like the birds will steal those seeds which are along the road. And people will step on them as they pass. They tell you, ah, come on, you and this salvation of yours. So you'll be stepped on and you'll be picked. Your seed will be picked and then you have nothing. And then you're pulled back by the world because you are not rooted in the right soil and the right environment. And finally, we have that person who is like this seed which was thrown in the right soil, the right environment, the right climate and everything. This means this person was thrown in the right doctrine, the right word of God. He was told that in, in uh, following Christ, you'll face persecutions, you'll face good times, you'll face some hard times, you'll face this and that. You have to stick with the word and the Bible says this. And the reason that you're saved is not to have a good life here on earth, but to have it in, in heaven. Don't store your riches here on earth, store them in heaven. So once you're rooted in that and then you get to understand what exactly salvation is, you understand it 100%, then you're rooted in the right soil. You start growing, you start making roots and you start growing up and you can see and you can filtrate. When you see a false teacher teaching you, you can say, hey, I can design you. You, you're a liar. You, you're true. I can see that. That is false. That is true. Because you you're rooted in the word of God and the Holy Spirit is inside you so you can grow and you can read and you can understand. Are you seeing the point? So unless you see this and unless you're converted the right way, then you still have a false salvation. And that's why you'll say that, oh, I've seen the backsliding. There's nothing like backsliding. You only have two kinds of hearts. You have two kinds of bodies. I mean, not hearts. I mean, you have two kinds of bodies. The body of the flesh, of the sin, and you have the new body, which is the soul and the and the spirit together combined, which makes the new man. And this is explained very well by an example of the, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was also struggling with the two people inside him, the flesh and the, 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 the flesh and the, and, and, the, and the spiritual man. And Paul is telling us in Romans, Romans 7, um, from verse 14, 
Paul tells us something here. And this is Paul, the greatest apostle who has ever been. He's struggling with sin. Does it mean that uh, he, he's on sinning? He's going to tell us if he's the one. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, one side, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I am carnal, the flesh is carnal, but <laughs> the law of God is spiritual. God says, I've written my laws in your hearts and in your minds that you may live my way. So the law of God is spiritual, but I am carnal, I'm, I'm still walking, I'm still on this earth. For that which I, I do, uh, for that which I do, I allow not. This is Paul saying that some of the things that I do, I don't allow them. I'm doing opposite from what my spirit is wanting to do. For what I would, that I do not. And the things that I really, really want to do for God, I want to walk well, I want to be a godly man. I don't do them. Sometimes I fail. But what I hate, that I do. This is Paul saying that I continuously do sinful things. Oh my, I do sinful things. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I try to do these good things, but I find myself doing wrong things. And then he continues. If then I do that which I will not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So if I continue doing wrongful things, I am trying to convince myself that what I'm doing is good. Now, listen, now it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So Paul is saying, it is not the new man, the new creature who is doing these things, who is trying to convince and pretend to be doing these things, but it is sin, the body of the sin, which is doing these things. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, you see, he's dividing He's saying, not in my spirit, not in the new man, not in the new creature. He's saying, for I know that in me, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He is trying, the Holy Spirit is in him, he's telling him, do the right things, follow the Holy Spirit. But the flesh is telling him, no, follow the other way. He's trying to, you know, gamble between the two. For the good that I will not do, but the evil which I will not, that I do. Is continue with the story. Now, if I do that I will not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. It is not the new man, but it is sin. I find then a law that when I will do good, evil is present with me. The new man is doing good, but also the evil flesh is also present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. You see, there are two kinds of men in you. There's the inward man and there's the outward man. The outward man is the flesh. The inward man is the new creature. But I see another law in my members. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So, the law of my mind, we have a new mind with Christ. He has given us a new mind. So there's a new law in our minds. God has written his laws in our minds and in our hearts. So now I see another law in my members. Members is what? My flesh, which is warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body from the body of this death, this body is a body which is going to die. And we will be given another body. So he's saying, who will deliver me from this sinful body? Body of death means a sinful body. But then he says this, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You see the contradiction between the two bodies, the inner body and the outer body. So this one already explains to you that someone who is saved cannot sin. You cannot sin. How can you say you're sinning? And uh, the new creature inside you, it is born of God. You're born again. Can you say, I am unborn? Can you tell your mother, mom, I'm not really sure if you really gave birth to me. You know, let me go back. No, it's not possible. No matter how bad you are. If today you wake up and you transgress, you do all the disgrace, 
against your parents and go away and call them names and you know do all the evil things out there and you become a thief the mother will do is to tell you please my son my daughter come back don't do this don't do that but even if you're shot there or you're killed by mob justice you will be they will be called and told hey come and pick your child pick your daughter pick your son and go and bury him and your parents will bury you at their home why because you are a child of them exactly we are adopted children of god we are adopted we have been adopted in the family of God. So we are children of God. And of course, they are both children of obedience and children of disobedience in every family. There's always obedient children and disobedient children. And what happens? Jesus says that I chasten the, the children of disobedience. I beat them a little bit. That's why sometimes you will see you're a Christian, but sometimes things are not really going well. Maybe something uh, somewhere, Jesus, you know, he, he chastened you in a way. He told you, no, I, don't, I will not give you that. I will not give you that gift that you're asking me because I know you will waste. I know you will do something which is not right. I know you will use that money to go and get drunk and, you know, you, 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 uh, and, uh, you, you destroy my testimony. I know if I give you that extra cash, you will start... Yeah, it's showing people how much you're rich and how much uh, you, you have this and that. And you'll, instead of giving a good testimony, you'll give a bad testimony. And you'll see a good child, when he prays, he tells God, please, God, give me this and that. God will give him. The Bible says the lilies of the fields, they don't work, yet they, 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 they flourish. The birds of the air, they don't work, yet they, they eat. Are you no much important than them? Doesn't God who is above in heaven know, does he not know how to give his children good gifts? He knows. But the reason that you don't get the good gifts is because probably you're a child of disobedience. Probably you're doing wrong things in one way or another. But if you're a good person, he will listen to you and he will give you good things. So the Bible is very clear concerning you never losing your salvation and that the new creature inside you can never sin. And the Bible tells us, if you're a saved person, don't follow the flesh. And let me share my screen again here. Let me show you something. The Bible tells us in uh, 2 Timothy, Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, uh, 19, it tells us this. Uh, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone, the Bible says this, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you say that you're saved, please depart from following the flesh, follow the spirit, do the things of God, walk in the ways of God, because that is exactly what he wants us to do, okay? Do the things of God. And maybe I'll check out uh, uh, one or two. Uh, let me show you two more verses, and then I, I, I finish up. First Timothy, First Timothy 5, uh, 20. First Timothy 5, 20. It says this, First Timothy 5, 20. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Why is the Bible saying this? When you see someone is doing something which is sinful, is following the flesh, rebuke before all so that others may fear and they might understand this is sin. So for those people who say, oh, do not judge, do not judge, do not judge. Come on, refute that verse. Say that verse is wrong. Okay. And uh, let me show you 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The Bible says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is not common, that such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted? God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will, but will with temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. The Bible tells us very well, God will not give you, the, he will not allow any temptation beyond what you can bear. 
He'll not allow any temptation beyond what you can hold. So for if you are a Christian and you keep on saying, oh, I'm saved, I'm really trying to walk in the spirit, but I'm always in temptations. Remember, there's no temptation which can be so big that you cannot bear. God says that he'll always provide a way to escape. So if there's something which is coming and is really tempting you to do something wrong, just tell God, even if you're heading and you're there and you're saying, oh God, maybe uh, you're just somewhere, you're walking in, in the streets and then the police are here and they ask you, hey, why are you not wearing mask? Give us 200 shillings, uh, bribe us with some 200 shillings or else we'll take you to jail. And you're there thinking, oh God, no, bribing is a sin. Now, do I take six months in jail because of just 200 shillings? Now, what do I do? At that juncture, you tell God, God, you've told us one thing that you will never give us. There is no temptation which will come and you don't give us a way to escape. So God, I'm about to give these 200 shillings to corrupt myself, you know, to give for corruption. But please help me. Give me a way to escape. And I tell you the truth. The moment you tell God that, even before you remove that money, you'll just say, oh, how are you doing? Hey, I saw you somewhere or something happens or, or maybe he forgets about it or maybe, you know, God will provide a way to escape because you have asked him. Even if you're heading and you're saying, I'm heading to do something which I know, I have no other option. This is evil, but I have to do it. Always tell God, God, please open a way for me to escape. I don't know I'm, I'm going to do this. Unless you open a way, I'm, I'm going to find myself doing this. So God, please open a way. And for sure, 100%, he'll provide a way to escape. That's the beauty of God and the beauty of salvation. So I think that's has really been a blessing to understand that a Christian has two parts. You can never sin. The new man can never sin but the flesh can sin. So walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. So I hope that has been a blessing. Maybe I can, I can hear a comment. Please, Esther you, can, Esther, you can give us a comment concerning the same. If you can hear me. Can uh, say good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, for me, I, I thank you for the word. Today's word was really powerful, <laughs> but um, what uh, stuck out for me the most was throughout the throughout the preaching, what kept on ringing. I'm thinking uh, because of Romans five nine, the vast the, the thing that kept on ringing in my head over and over again is when we were kids we used to sing a song that says I know nothing can separate me from the, love of, the love of Christ yeah yes I know I know nothing can separate me from the love of Christ but I don't think singing the song we truly understood what it means because even as the as the adults taught us, taught us this song we'll still hear them talk about so and so has black backslid some of the so and so has backslid mm -hmm. but if nothing can separate me from the love of Christ how how has this person backslid you see so I don't, I don't think even we, the kids or them, they, the adults understood exactly what they were telling us. They were teaching us something that they, even them, even they did not understand. So uh, for this verse, it, uh, for the, especially Romans 5, 9, it just took me straight back to childhood mm. and to that very, very song. Awesome. Yes, so that was my biggest take, take home this, this, uh, this session. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. Hope it's been a blessing. Uh, <clears throat> one thing, uh, maybe just to add on top of that, is that uh, Jesus said that I have kept you at the palm of my hands, and no one can be able to take you away from me. And my Father, who gave me to you, is powerful, and you are also at his palm. <laughs> now, just imagine you are here. This, 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 is, this is basically you. And uh, you are here in the palm of Jesus. And Jesus is strong. And he says, my father who gave me to you, I'm all, <laughs> he's also holding you as well. Like you can just imagine the double force. So who will be able to take you away? And he says, no one can pluck you from there. So if the Bible says no one can pluck you from there, do you think Satan is going to bring some weird thoughts and then he pulls you out from God? It's not possible. 
There's no way he can pull you out from there unless you had a false conversion. For the people who have false conversions are the ones who are, you know, they come out from there because in the first place, they were not even there. In the first place, they were not with us because the Bible is clear. It says they went out from us because they were not even with us in the first place. But if you're really rooted in the true doctrine of Christ, there's nothing which can separate you. Paul says, there's nothing, not things above, not things below, not things here, not things to come, not things anywhere, not even ourselves. <laughs> can we separate ourselves from the love of Christ? Because he says nothing even created and the verse is just well explaining. So that means if you hear somebody has been separated from Christ, then that's a lie. They're either just living carnally, like a carnal Christian, or they were not saved in the first place. So there's no way you can lose your salvation. It's absolutely. And if you could lose salvation, then it could not be called eternal life. Why do we call salvation eternal life? I will, you will not perish. You will have eternal life. Eternal means forever. If it's eternal, then how, can you lose something which is eternal? No, you can't lose something which is eternal. It could have been told, uh, for whoever believes in him will have, you know, temporary life. But the Bible tells us it's eternal life. Once you have that life, you have it once and for all. Once you die, it is appointed unto men once to die and after that judgment. So you have died already once. There's no way you're going to die two or three times. So I hope it has been a blessing. For those who are watching us on Facebook, please uh, feel free. We're always uh, uh, doing Bible studies every Mondays. Mondays um, and Wednesday and Friday at 9 p.m. Please feel free and uh, be blessed. Always join us. You can also inbox me if uh, you have any query. And as well, uh, we also have a WhatsApp group. You can join us as well. You can inbox me to add you on the group. So God bless you and have a blessed time. Let's say just a short word of prayer before we finish. God, we thank you. We bless you and we worship you as we finish this and as we uh, live for the rest of the night. Lord, we pray that you may be with us. We thank you for your word. Let it sink in our minds and let you speak to us even much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night. Uh, Good night. Uh, bye.